Edge of Eternity is the third book in my trilogy about the 20th century, and it opens in 1961 with the building of the Berlin Wall. But at the same time, in the United States, there's another story which forms a sub-theme of Edge of Eternity, and that is the story of African Americans and their struggle for civil rights. In 1961, began what's called the Freedom Ride. And two of the principal characters in Edge of Eternity are part of a group of civil rights protesters who boarded a bus in Washington, D.C. and rode it south into segregation country. In order to deepen my own understanding of this, I boarded a Greyhound bus in Washington, D.C. and I rode the bus into the Deep South, just as the Freedom Riders did in 1961, and just as my fictional characters do in 1961. On this bus ride, I took the opportunity to visit historic places in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to the building which was Martin Luther King's headquarters throughout the Civil Rights Campaign. I went to the famous church, the Ebenezer Baptist Church, where there is now a huge civil rights area with a wonderful museum and the tomb of Martin Luther King and his wife, Coretta Scott King. The museum contained pictures and video which I found terribly moving, even though I thought I knew all this stuff, to see pictures, for example, of the Freedom Riders rehearsing how they would non-violently accept the beatings that they feared they might suffer. This is training in non-violence. How to lie there and not hit back when people are beating you up. Just incredible. George Jakes and Maria Summers, like the real-life Freedom Riders, rehearsed for the kind of confrontation that they knew they were going to get into. But uh, nothing that they rehearsed was as bad as what actually did happen to them. In chapter four of Edge of Eternity, the Freedom Ride bus pulls out of Atlanta on Sunday morning, Mother's Day, and drives across the state line into Alabama. And they're on the bus in Anniston, which is where we are now, in the bus station, when the bus is attacked by a screaming mob of white racists. The bus drove into the bus station, and from apparently nowhere, a mob appeared, armed with baseball bats, chains, and tire irons, in a pattern that would recur in the South. After about 15 minutes of this, the police, who had been watching the whole thing, moved in and said, OK, boys, you've had your fun. That's enough. The bus managed to get away from Aniston bus station, but it was followed by a convoy of cars, and the bus stopped. The racists all got out of their cars with their clubs and their tire irons and their chains, and they started attacking the bus again. One of them went to the trunk of his car and took something out, which he set light to and threw through a window of the bus, and it was a firebomb. It set fire to the bus, the bus began to fill with smoke, and the white racists then held the doors of the bus shut in an attempt to burn the Freedom Riders to death, right here on this road. Some of the worst atrocities of this period took place in Birmingham, Alabama. We went to the famous 16th Street Baptist Church. This church was the center of the civil rights movement in Birmingham. It's most famous for the greatest tragedy of the civil rights era. 
It was the 15th of September 1963, a Sunday. There was a service going on in this church and in the large basement of the church, a number of children gathering for Sunday school. When a bomb went off, a, a big bomb, it shattered windows across the street. It destroyed one side of the church. It turned cars upside down and it killed four Sunday school girls. Three of them were 14 and one was 11 years old. The bombing was news all over the world and moved people everywhere. In particular, in Wales, where I come from, a small country, part of the United Kingdom. But the people of Wales raised the money to replace some of the stained glass in this church. They financed this wonderful stained glass window. They call it the Wales window. At the funeral service, Martin Luther King gave the eulogy and said, we must not stop loving our white brothers. These quotes are fantastic. He takes some issue and he rises above the conflict and he strikes the moral note. George Jakes and Maria Summers are, of course, fictional characters. They're people I've invented. Uh, but I've put them into a real life situation. I've put them into the real Freedom Ride alongside the real people who were on that bus. And everything that happened actually happened to real historical people who were on that bus. The fictional George Jakes begins as a civil rights campaigner in 1961. He's one of the original Freedom Riders. The real life John Lewis began as a civil rights campaigner. He was on the original Freedom Ride and he is now a United States Congressman. And so I'm going to interview him. It's an, honor to, it's an honor to meet you, sir. Good to meet you, sir. During the entire time of my involvement in the civil rights movement, I never became angry. I went to Sunday school, and as a little child, I was taught to love. So when people start talking about the philosophy of nonviolence, the way of love, the way of peace, the way of passive resistance, it was very um, easy for me to accept that way. I think I have what I call a sense of righteous indignation, but anger, no. Uh, you come to that point, you say, you beat me, you throw me in jail, you try to kill me, but I'm not gonna let you pull me down. But you were a kid. How did you get so smart? How did you know? No, I don't think I, I, I don't think I was smart at all. Uh, uh, I, I, I felt that we had unbelievable teachers. We were prepared to down the free around for what we believed in. With faith, hope, and love, keep your eyes on the prize. John Lewis, 8th of May, 2013. I think I'll keep that. My philosophy is that history must never be violated in my novels. I use fictional characters so that I can be free to use my imagination to explore their emotions and of course that means that the reader has the same experience of feeling those emotions as these terrible events take place.